Can you hear me now? Oh, really? Oh, okay. Are we good? Okay. All right. This is weird. Hello? <laughs> I don't know if they can hear me. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> um, so really happy y'all are here. Um, I wanted to take a moment and thank uh, Maestro Miles for all of your support for today for Trombone Day. Um, so we'll be doing just a, a discussion here. We'll, of course, leave some room for any questions that you guys may have. Um, my friend here will have a microphone if you have any questions. Um, but I'm just going to start with a couple that y'all submitted when you um, registered for Trombone Day. Um, so we wanted to start with Ricardo. Um, what was your inspiration for writing this piece? So do we need to go closer? Yes. Well, hello, everybody. So sometimes this is a question that is asked a lot to composers. Like, where did, did you get the inspiration? And I, I feel like people is waiting an answer just like, you know, I was inspired by this book or by this landscape. And this piece doesn't have any inspiration like that. But <laughs> <laughs> I would say that the character of a piece like this, this is a, just a concerto, has a lot to do with how you felt in that moment when you were writing this. So I would say that is, in, uh, according to this question, I would go back to where I was when I was writing this, which was in the fourth floor at Juilliard. <laughs> I was just there practicing, and in the free moments, I was writing this concerto. So back then, you know, uh, it was my first year at Juilliard, and you know, it was a new world for me. I was very far from home. So composing was kind of uh, a way to go away from stress. I'm not saying stress. <laughs> yes. A little bit. So you <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, Joe was great, but you know, it's a lot of commitment and you need to work a lot, especially you know, in my case, I had many problems the, fir the first year I got there, many things to fix. So composing was a moment where I could just stay there and relax. So that's what I could s say about this, yeah, this piece, that it was a moment of peace, and that, that can be maybe reflected on the second movement. Mm -hmm. And what I could go through is, it, it, so as I said, I don't get inspired by a landscape or anything like that, but I can say exactly where I was uh, at each of the bars that I was writing. Like if, if you ask me, where, when did you write the second movement theme? I can tell you, I was in this room, uh, <laughs> and for some reason the, the, the melody came to my mind. So yeah. that's a little bit the background of this story. Julia, first year. Um, awesome, yes. thank you, Ricardo. <laughs> Um, the next question is for Maestro Miles. Um, how did you prepare for a performance with so many concerti and a major work? Uh, a lot of screaming and yelling. <laughs> uh, not true. <laughs> yeah. See, the students out there know. Um, actually, it, it was a, a, a tremendous challenge, and, and I was really happy to take this on and, and, and collaborate with Ben and, and, and all the different artists we're having today. So we have six different guest artists on our program tonight. For a student orchestra, that's an enormous undertaking. Um, and the other thing about it is that every piece is unfamiliar to them. There's not a Beethoven symphony, there's not a Brahms concerto, there's nothing there that they have ever played before or ever seen before, including the Moya piece. So um, I just presented it as a challenge to them to take four weeks of rehearsal time, normally we have five, to prepare 70 minutes of music. Normally we prepare 50 to 55. And all new music and see if they could rise to the challenge. And, and I think they, they have done that extremely well, especially in the case of the Moya. They, they really enjoy playing that piece. So um, it's, it's been hard work, and, but I think, uh, I think tonight's gonna be a great success. Yeah, amazing, we're looking forward to it. Um, ben, the next question is for you, um, or Dr. McElwain. Um, <laughs> um, how have you prepared to play 
so much today and also run a trombone day. Yeah, I, I, I'm still working on that. I, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I think one thing, uh, this, it's so exciting to, to finally have this day here and, and something that we, we've been talking about and thinking about. And so I remember, I mean, I, I started practicing. I mean, the Moya is not very easy, Ricardo. <laughs> I'm sorry. And <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was one thing, you know, just trying to be very strategic in, in, in my preparation and, and um, you know, holding myself accountable and, and things throughout, throughout the process. And, um, you know, I think one thing I always tell my students is always make sure you get your fundamentals in. And then most of the hard stuff, except for that one lift. <laughs> last few minutes. It usually takes care of itself, you know. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, I think that's that's the plan is, is, is always be just very methodical and um, aspirational as you go through this process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jeremy, the next question's for you, or Professor Wilson. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to, first of all, thank you for, for coming in last minute to play a concerto with an orchestra. Um, and I wanted to ask you, being this your second time where you kind of fill in very last minute for, for the mm -hmm. Moya concerto, um, how's your preparation been and, and what has that process been like for you, especially in a, in a last minute capacity? Sure. Hi. Um, so yeah, the, 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 pre, the only other time I played the, the piece um, was also a last minute thing where I was asked to come in and play, uh, play the part that Dr. McElwain is playing. So that, that's been really fun also to, um, to get to know both parts because as I was playing uh, the part that Dr. McElwain's playing tonight, um, previously with the Huntsville Symphony, uh, I would get jealous of some of the other, the stuff that's in the other part. Oh, I wish I got to play that. You know, and, now I get, and now I get to play it, right? So um, uh, also because it's not quite as high. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't have as many high notes. Um, but no, it's been... Um, the, the good thing is that uh, Ricardo knows how to write for the trombone. Uh, not only like what lays well on the instrument, but also musically what the instrument is capable of. Sometimes the trombone can be a bit of a mystery for composers, or they, or they, they kind of use what they've been taught in their orchestration classes or whatever, and they just, you know, they think of the trombone as this monolithic thing. And so what I love is that throughout the piece, we're asked to, to really soar and sing and be delicate, uh, but also those, you know, those power moments as well too. So um, it was a lot, of, a lot of listening, a lot of score study, um, and then relying on the, the work that I had done before with the other part. Um, and then also just making sure that, that endurance uh, is, you know, because uh, I'm playing several things today that, that are pretty choppy. Uh, and so I was, I've told a few of you that I, I basically practiced all the pieces twice, back to back, uh, just to make sure that I could make it through all of them. So if I can kind of get by all of them twice in a row, then I should theoretically <laughs> be able to get through all of them once. Um, so uh, that was a big factor. But then also, um, whenever I'm preparing a concerto, I always think about uh, projection. Most of what I do uh, is you know solo recitals and things with piano. And, and in a room this size, you know, but when you're then on a stage with an orchestra behind you, a much larger stage, all of my dynamic decisions and articulation decisions are, are based on, I really want to make sure that even the people in the back row can understand what I'm saying and, and can hear what I'm doing. Yeah, awesome, thank you. That was a lot of words, I hope someone will <laughs> No, it was fantastic. Um, and last but not least, Joe, um, we wanted to ask you, for, for someone like you that's, you know, played all over the world in all these various capacities um, and also in a soloistic capacity. How do you determine the repertoire that you either present to orchestras or that you choose to solo with? Um, what I do is I give the orchestra a repertoire list that I play. So, you know, Tomasi or the Bramwell, Toby, some things are written for me, so I tend to put some of those on there if they're, if they're you know, crowd pleasers. Um, but I just usually send the, this repertoire list. There's probably 20 pieces on there, and, and then um, and I think maybe that's what we did for this. I'm not 100% sure. For the, the Albertsberger was supposed to be on the program, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, so 
and that's on my repertoire list. So that's that's what I do, and I sort of have a discussion with the the music director and what they're interested. In. You know, the Rouse concertos on there, and several other newer pieces. Um, so I, I don't usually say that, hey, I want to do this. Sometimes I will, but sometimes I'm just, you know, it should be a collaboration between the music director and the, and the soloist. Yeah. And one of your, you know, major pillars of your legacy is, is the amount of works you've commissioned. Um, what is that process like for you, working with composers and, and getting some of these new works to life? Um, in, in New York, uh, it's sort of, these opportunities come along more, uh, more often than not. Uh, there, there's, um, you know, the Peasley, for instance, the Richard Peasley. That, that was uh, written for, uh, started off being written for Jim Pugh, but then Peasley came around and said, you know, I'm trying to get uh, Jim's attention. He's very busy right now. I, I kind of want to get this going, and it says, well, as long as Jim is okay with it, and so he, he said, you know, I checked with him, and he's fine. You know, so I, I worked it up and, and um, it's now a staple in the repertoire. So uh, I just think it, uh, and I'm, of course, I'm still looking for, you know, more opportunities. Um, next month I go to Atlanta and do the uh, Bruce Broughton uh, piece. At, he's a film composer. He, he um, composed Silverado, the movie. I don't know if you know the score, but uh, fine, fine composer and he wrote a very nice wind band piece. Uh, so wind band actually is, there's more opportunities for wind band, I think, than there is for uh, orchestra. Now, Ricardo and I have talked, and maybe he, he might be writing a, another piece for me, I hope. But, um, but he said, you know, we really should make it for wind band and for orchestra. You know, um, so the wind band uh, arena <clears throat> is much more accepting of a trombone soloist, but um, you know, in the case of John Mackey's uh, piece, uh, that was very successful. Uh, and he, al he always wanted to get it into the orchestra repertoire. And he he's had a few successes, success with that, not a lot, but um, it's really hard to sell a trombone concerto. Now, the, I think the person that's uh, really strong with this is uh, uh, Jürgen von Rhein. He's, he's, he's the new champion, I think. And he's he's you know he's commissioning works and and uh, some f by f by some fine composers really you know prestigious composers and so my my latest contribution was the Chick Corea trombone concerto so I I got to play it once in in um, Brazil and uh, then I had to cancel you know the 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 uh, the, the uh, engagement uh, the the first week of February, I was going to go to to Poland, but I get another chance in Portugal. So, and then there's other chances, you know. So, if you can find, that's what you know. That's what violin soloists do. They will travel around and just repeat the same uh, the same piece. So, um, I'm happy to do that with Chikoria. So, <laughs> very much. So, anyway. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Yes. Um, and last question Sorry. for Ricardo. Um, do you ever, as from a composition standpoint, um, get worried about running out of themes or ideas? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but... Uh, so I use the same one in all three movies. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's a, <laughs> an interesting point. But what I usually do is I have kind of a storage of melodies. And uh, to this day, I haven't taken the best ones. So what I'm doing is, you know, every day you spend a few, sometimes it can be one hour, sometimes it can be a few minutes. And at some point, a, a good melody comes in, on, or, a, or a good progression, chord progression, or uh, any material that, that you feel that it has quality enough to be in a piece. So then I, first of all, when, when it happens, I record it on my phone and I store it, it in a folder. Uh, and then I give it a name depending on the character. Maybe it can be mysterious, it can be sad, or it can be. And I have a, about like 
a hundred melodies that are there. Some, sometimes I, for, I forget that some of them exist, so I go back to this catalog. Um, I, and then I rate them as well, <laughs> saying like, oh, you know, I, I care so much about this melody. I'm not gonna use it un unless a big opportunity comes. Um, so in this piece, I think some of the most of the melodies are in this upper list, and, and because it, this was the, the first chance I had to, to to have one of my pieces performed by, as he said, uh, Jorgen Van Ryan. He was in the premiere of this piece, and also Michel Vequet. So I decided this is a great opportunity too. But but still, I, I fear that someday I will run out of <laughs> <laughs> melodies. But well, yes, you can take them from another. That's one thing I was thinking. It is, that's one of the things I appreciate about you. Appreciate about you as a composer is uh, all of your works that I've interacted with are have a lot of different themes in them, like more than the average. And it just, I think you're a generous composer in that way. You know, just whatever whatever the piece needs, you're willing to use those things. If I had, I would probably come up with like two good melodies my entire life. You know, <laughs> you know, and so like, you, you know, I, it just, I, th I just think, yeah. I appreciate your generosity as a composer. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I feel that sometimes using too many themes or material, it can uh, lead to uh, a mistake. Because sometimes if, if you don't uh, take care of structure, and you use too, too many melodies at the same point, it can ruin the entire uh, thing. So you need to be very careful about using too many themes in, in the same uh, piece. So I would rather use one and then divide it by different elements and try to use it during the entire piece. Kind of like Beethoven did in the, back in the days. But yeah. So that's the idea a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and for real, last question um, is for Maestro Miles. Um, what advice would you have for an aspiring trombone soloist from the perspective of a maestro on, on how to prepare or how to, how to do it? Uh, an, that's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> practice a lot. Um, I, really, it, it's uh, one of the things that we're actually finding with um, our, our student um, soloists tonight um, is that there's a lot of inconsistency in what they come, what they bring to each rehearsal. Uh, and that, that just goes along with the territory. People are young, they haven't matured enough to, to really have things nailed down in, in a particular way. And what, what people don't understand generally about working with orchestras is that, that if you're used to working with an accompanist, an accompanist can respond to a change that you make in a phrase or a tempo instantly. Well, an orchestra is like the Titanic, and it's going down if <laughs> you don't get it steered in the right direction. And it takes a lot to change an orchestra. So everybody in the orchestra, I can, I can sense a change if someone makes a change, but to convey that to the orchestra and then to have them respond to it, they're also students. So I would say the, the, the best thing that you can do when you're preparing a, a solo is to, to figure out how you want it to go and be able to play it that way every single time. Can I just say something yeah. real quick? Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the case of this Chicoria Trombone Concerto, uh, I practiced, and Jeremy's done a lot of this in Chicago, but I practiced uh, a lot with, uh, so I, I got a, a really nice uh, MIDI, not even MIDI, but it's a um, very high, high quality orchestra track from the orchestrator. And so I just put it in my digital audio workstation and I just started recording the whole piece. And I can tell you, just from that, that is the greatest way to be prepared because you're, you're, you're trying to you know, fit everything into the orchestra and it's not going to bend for you. It's a computer, okay? So um, it's, it, you know, that's, I think that's, uh, so when I went to the Sao Paulo Symphony, I knew every move they, they were going to make, you know? So anyway, just something to think about if you're going to prepare. Um, use technology to help you get ready for that big moment. <clears throat> yeah.
Absolutely. Um, two things. Uh, the awesome crew just said we don't have to move the mics, that they'll just pick up our sound. So Great. we're good. Um, and now I want to open it up to the audience. Do you, do you all have any questions you want to ask? We have a mic here um, for those live streaming right hearing. Right here oh, stage. perfect. Uh, so this question is for you, Karen. Oh. Uh, if you had a top three, like three recommendations for someone wanting to start a music-oriented business and a top three don'ts for someone wanting to start uh, a business of that nature, what would those be? Yeah, um, I would say to pursue the, the relationships first. Um, like this moment is a dream come true. Um, and to just be flexible for whatever you think the path that you're supposed to be on. I have a degree in classical saxophone. What does that mean? Um, so, and here we are. So it's just kind of being flexible. So I would say being flexible, prioritizing relationships um, and experience. You cannot improvise experience. So the more you do something, um, the better you will be. Um, and unfortunately, that's not always something you learn in a book. Um, there's a lot of theory around business, but there's so much benefit to actually doing. Um, and the don't component um, would be to make sure you're financially literate, um, which is something that I was not when I started. Um, I would also say make sure it's never about the money. Um, I would do everything that I do for free, and I'm very blessed to be able to say that 10 years into that. Um, and then to also not overestimate what you can do in a year and underestimate what you can do in a decade. There's so much that we could look at year to year and feel like we're falling behind or like we're not doing enough. But if you look back at the whole career, like everybody here, it's just extraordinary what is in store for you. Thank you. Anybody else? I have a question for, um, Miss, is it Mr. or Dr. Alessi? I like doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Dottore. Yeah. <laughs> right, go ahead, sir. Um, so, have you, or should you, and ha or and have you, ever changed a solo because your the solo is does it, you believe that you should add something or not add something to it? Uh, I mean, if it was, if it needed to be corrected. Or like you didn't agree how it was written. <clears throat> Well, we talked about that the other day in the class, and I think it's the job of the soloist to whatever you're dealt with, you have to really sell the piece no matter what. You know, you can sell, this is why I think practicing with three notes, you know, just pick any three notes and find different ways to play those three notes. Different dynamics, different articulations, uh, different speeds, different patterns, different, uh, uh, you know, maybe slurred tongue. You can, <clears throat> you can, um, you can sell anything. I think. You know, yes. Mm -hmm. There's. I've come across some, you know, pieces that are not so strong. But um, I've always, you know, followed it through. You know, and I've learned. I've learned. I've learned. You know, so I learned about uh, some pieces are, are over the top difficult. But I, I usually found a way to play them, you know. So anyway, it's just it's a challenge that the soloist uh, loves. Actually, is is if you something you're dealt with, mm -hmm. and it's not the greatest, or it's too hard, or you know, or whatever, you have to figure it out. The soloist has to figure it out. Yeah. So, could could I add to that? Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, now I'm a little behind Mr. Dr. Alessi here <laughs> in terms of. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've, I've, now it's a little over 30 pieces in the last seven years that I've been able to commission or co-commission. I've only ever asked a composer to change anything one time, and it was um, Kevin Day, who I, who I just premiered a sonata of his back at the ITF. And the penultimate measure was so difficult. Like, I, I, I just had a dialogue with him where I said, I can play it, but I probably won't ever want to play it again. Uh, and And there will be maybe five people on the whole planet that can play this piece because of the next to last measure. And so if you want it to be played by more than five people on the planet, maybe consider, you know, and of course he was so gracious and was, of course, yes, I want to, he's a euphonium player and the next to last measure was a very euphonium-esque kind of lick, you know. And of course, Mr. Alessi could play it. I mean, a lot of, you know, there would be a few people that could play it. But, uh, you know, I also, 
just wanted to have a dialogue with him and see what his aspirations for the piece were. Um, he, he might not have been bothered by the fact that very few people could play it, you know. He, but I think having that dialogue is, is also really important. He did. He did end up changing it. Yeah. Oh yeah, and I, I just he refreshed my memory. Chick Corea, when he <laughs> wrote the concerto, uh, he every movement ended quietly. Oh, and, okay. And mm -hmm. so I I had the courage to ask Chick Corea, you know, could you change the ending? <laughs> and I remember when I asked him, it was kind of silence. <laughs> I said, well, why do you want to do that? And I explained to him, it was a tango, and I, I did some program notes in my, on the top of my head, and, and that is, when you do a tango, it's usually slow, and then at the end it gets all exciting, and then you, you finish with a big finish. And, and uh, almost like the, the two dancers, one dancer has won over the other dancer. And there's a victory kind of thing going on there. And, uh, and so when I said that, he, he understood and he wrote a fast tango section. And uh, so anyway, like God, God you know, I'm, I'm so um, disappointed he's not around so we could chat about that. But mm -hmm. anyway, that's, that, maybe that was one of the few times I asked for a rewrite. Yeah. Great. Great question. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yes, very good question. We have time for two more questions. Yes. You got it. Go, Trey. Go. Thank you. Um, so I just kind of have like a general question for. Um, I know a lot of you guys are teachers. Um, and I want to be a middle school band director, but I also want to perform, like hopefully with an orchestra or a wind ensemble. So how would you balance that, like your teaching career plus traveling and performing? Well, I think, I think, sorry, I almost grabbed the mic. <laughs> Don't. Did, a, did a bad thing. Um, I think one of the things that I always tell my students you know, regardless of what their major is in music education, for example, um, you know, the, the trombone, that's your vehicle for, for musical expression, uh, for fundamentals and that sort of thing. So I think that's, you know, as far as how I approach um, performing is, is always in that vein, right? Um, and then I think it's, you know, I remember in high school, my band director was a clarinet player and um, he did his master's in clarinet performance in Cincinnati. He played with, actually with Huntsville Symphony and, and uh, some of the other orchestras there around Middle Tennessee. And uh, I remember during lunch period, he would be playing, you know. Clar or, uh, my wife's a clarinetist and I always joke which hand goes on top. <laughs> um, uh, but that, that was w one of the things. And uh, I remember I asked him a similar question, you know, because I, I knew I wanted to play trombone. I didn't know what that looked like and I really didn't for a long time, uh, what that would end up being. Um, and I think it's up to us, you know, you know, up to you to make sure that that remains a priority. I think it's, it's so important, you know, for a, a young student, a middle school student, a high school student to, to see their teacher still playing, you know? I think that's so, I know we have some band directors here. I know, yeah, uh, one of my students, his, his dad, Jody Dunn, is over at Crestview High School. Um, and I think, I mean, you still have, have your trombone and he still plays some, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's important. If you make it a priority, you know, you can, you can do that. Now, I will say this, teacher shops are a real thing, you know, and, and being a band director, I see some nods. Being a band director, it's really hard to maintain that sort of thing. So you have to be really efficient with your time. Um, but yeah, if it's important to you, you can make, make that work. Please. Can I just add just quickly? Please. Please. You, you can also figure out how trombone playing and conducting go hand in hand. Mm. Okay, so when you're practicing and you're, not, you're having something, some trouble with the phrase, and I talked to some, one of the students about this, go ahead and sing and conduct. Work on your conducting also, okay, and sing and conduct and then play the trombone. And invariably this fixes so many things about your playing. So anyway, uh, you, you, you can, and then, and then what you learn from phrasing on the trombone, okay, you can apply that to when you're in front of a band, you know, a band, and, and use that knowledge 
to, to help you with the, the conducting as well. So anyway. I, I just want to say I think some of the calculus and some of the calculations that you make have to be, not to relate it back to body, mind, spirit, but based on your why and why you get up in the morning and why you, what your passion is about and how you want to impact the world. For me, um, I, if I woke up tomorrow not able to play the trombone anymore, I would be devastated. If I wasn't able to teach anymore, I, I would be lost. I wouldn't actually be who I am anymore. Um, that is such a big part of me. So for me, in my calculations, it was like, uh, which is going to be the deal breaker, you know? And uh, for me, it was like not being able to teach was a deal breaker. Like that was not acceptable for me anymore. Um, but I've still been able to find a way to keep my playing up in the solo stuff and all that stuff as part of my career. But I think that, that has to go into it as well, just kind of that self-discovery of, what really drives you, what really fulfills you. You know, Alain Trudell comes to mind. Now, he's, of yeah. course, a great trombonist, one of the greatest yeah. we have. And, but he doesn't play it, really, that yeah. much. A little bit. But he, he can pick up, I remember I did something, the Johann de May two-bone concerto with him. <laughs> and, he, you know, he just hasn't played, he hadn't played it much. <laughs> and he got up there and, you know, he knew how the music went. You know, if yeah. you know how the music goes, you have it in your head, you know, sometimes the amount of practicing is not that important, but, you know, for somebody like him. Yeah. 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 One more question. Yes. All right, so as we're all musicians, but, you know, clearly, you know, some people have bad days. And like when you're practicing, I especially have quite a few bad days every every now and then. But I'll get into a rut, and I just feel like, oh well, uh, I guess today's not the day. What what am I? You, you know, what I guess I'm just not going to practice as much today as I would any other day. How would you say? Is there is there a way, or do you guys have your, your like a special way to maybe get out of that rut on that certain day, or or just how to you know continue to get better even though you just you're not feeling like you're up to your potential and that can be for anybody okay um i in my former life i was a trumpet player and um i would say to you to listen to your body and listen to your mind and don't ignore them so this is sort of for everyone um but um i did ignore my body and my mind quite frequently. I was a type A personality, uh, perfectionist, wanted everything to be right, and I was on the horn six to eight hours a day. And it cost me my ability to be a trumpet player because I suffered a focal dystonia that ended my career. So um, I know that there are times when, you know, as you say, there are good days and bad days. And when it's a bad day, you can, you can put it away and you can come back another day and, and find a fresh uh, approach to it. And you can also change your approach to it that day. You know, mm -hmm. oh, I have to practice this. Well, it's not going well, practice something else mm -hmm. that, that might go well. <clears throat> but more than anything, don't, don't ignore the, the, the warning signs that, that tell you <coughs> This is not what you're supposed to be doing right now. I mean, you know, you can force your way through some things, but if, if it's just not going well, change what you're doing or change your outlook on what you're doing. I was, I was just gonna say. No, no, tranquilo. <laughs> no, because I'm not playing that much uh, lately, but I, I'm still doing a routine and I would say that Routine is the key sometimes because uh, probably uh, Joe, uh, Joe can agree because when I was, uh, when I got there uh, at Julia, um, in my mind I feel I had a few good conditions, let's say, but I was very wild and I had no a path. And I, at that moment I really have, I had like great dates and super bad days and I think it all came 
because of a lack of knowledge of what I was doing. And that knowledge, uh, you can refresh it every day in your routine and doing and knowing why you do everything. And that's what I learned from, from Joe because I had never done that. And I think that's the key to you know, solve a, a bad day. Because otherwise you, you say, okay, I feel bad, why I feel bad? If you don't know, then it's gonna be a bad day. But if you know the keys of why something is going wrong, then you can fix it to routine. Or I think that's how, I, how it helped me to have not that many bad days. <laughs> I think also acknowledging that everybody has bad days. Sometimes when I have been in a rut or having those bad days, it's easy to tell yourself like, there's something wrong with me. I bet all, I bet all my favorite players never had this day, you know, but literally we all have. And sometimes those string together into a rut right? or a plateau, right? Um, I think realizing that it's, it's a, a normal and maybe even necessary part of the process uh, to make sure uh, as a warning sign, you know, maybe it's a warning sign that there's a part of yourself that's being left out of the process. Maybe you need a break. Maybe you need, maybe your heart needs to be refilled. You know, uh, for me, when I've been in those places, um, it's almost always because I've forgotten why Tramone is awesome. And I've forgotten that this whole thing is a miracle, that we can make wavy air and, and it induces people's emotions. Like that's crazy pants. Um, and so just reminding myself of how cool that is uh, has for me gotten me out of those ruts many times. Yeah, I think maybe just quickly, it's also really important to remember, and I think Jeremy, you mentioned this earlier, um, something I always tell my students, and I'm kind of a hypocrite with this, I struggle with this, is when you have those bad days, don't associate that metal instrument mm -hmm. with your self-worth, yep. right? So, you know, if you crack that high F at the end of the volume <laughs> and he makes a face, it's okay. I'm still an okay human being, right? And, and the, the sun will rise again in the morning, right? So. Yeah. It's just not tonight. It's not tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, thank you all so much for your generosity and your time, and thank you guys for being here. Give us two minutes to reset and we're gonna have our, our Shires moment shortly.